Okay, I, I think we're about ready to get started here. So we've just invited a couple of our speakers to, to join us in a, a panel discussion and um, you can throw any questions you've had thought of during the day at them, but um, I guess just to get started, um, we've, we've gone from looking at uh, these traditional water deposit models and, and now we're looking at mineral systems in a broader sort of earth systems approach and, and that's been a theme through the, the, the whole day. Um, and one of the things is engaging industry and research as well. I think that's quite important, especially with the, the people we've got on the panel. We've got Cam from CET, Robbie with Amira, Trevor from um, GSWA, and, and John here as well. So, look, does anyone on the panel want to talk to that, or, or is there any questions in the audience <laughs> that we can get this thing started? Yeah. Okay. Is, is there anyone in, in the audience who wants to wants to start off? I've got one brave soul. <laughs> this is for John. Um, with your uh, upside inverted uh, thunderstorm, yeah. where do we find the clouds? And uh, you know, you we've talked a lot about pressure, but what about temperature? Well, absolutely. The, the, the clouds is, becomes a, a key ingredient in targeting, and that was at a scale, I suppose, in between my talk and what Cam emphasised. But the, the reservoir starts to become the critical entity that defines the CAM. In fact, the reservoir is the geological uh, concept. It is the geological entity that is the CAM. So we know what that is in, 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 in some more body types. Porphyries, we can know it quite well. And, when you've got high resolution geochronology in places like, say, uh, the Chukimata region, and you, you, you can map it and you can see really what these things look like. In the case of orogenic gold deposits, it's clearly somehow related to these anti-formal combinations, which John Walsh showed a cross section of, of Victory Defiance and, and, and the granite under there. That granite probably isn't the source, but it's, uh, it, it's coming into the dome, and the architecture of the dome is clearly a proxy in some way for, for underlying architecture of the reservoir. And one of the things that the PMD showed w when you did a 3D model is you typically saw nested uh, antiforms. So, so I think in gold it's clearly about antiforms, not that different from the petroleum story. In, in, in porphyry coppers it's, it's, it's really about the, the underlying intrusion as, as per the, the silito model. In the case of sedimentary hosted deposits, uh, what we often see I is a, a control by a impermeable layer. The Kufa Schiefer shows this quite well. So the, probably the key role of the Kufa Schiefer is not so much a, a key reductant but as a seal and that's the recent thinking, Borg et al's work on that and, and they're seeing the, the fluids in the underlying reservoir bounded by the Kufa Schiefer and also bounded by these steep structures with crystalline basement then the fluids are valving through, through that. So you know th that whole Lubin footprint is probably broadly a, a bit of a, a, a surface projection of the underlying reservoir. So there's a few different geometries that go on. Okay. Uh, who else would like to, have to say something? Yeah. Sorry. I suppose just um, triggered from um, the last iron ore um, presentation, which he uh, described what makes a giant iron ore system as distinct from um, other, other iron ore systems. And you mentioned about engaging industry. One way to engage industry is by helping them find very, very large or world class um, ore deposits. How would uh, our mineral systems understand, in, in my case, about gold change when you're trying to describe world class gold mineral systems, for example, as distinct from um, 100,000 ounce? Um, is there going to be much difference in the mineral system of a world class deposit versus uh, a smaller one? Was not sure whether that question was generic to iron ore or whether it was to, to all commodities, but it doesn't matter because it applies to both. What you see is when you focus on the larger deposits, you know, in any sort of regional targeting exercise you do, the architectural controls start to get clearer by and by and large. So you know, if you take a, a map of the Yulgarn and you plot out every single gold occurrence, it effectively maps greenstone belts. And then if you apply successively higher thresholds, the map gets more and more organised until finally it's picking a couple of, of, of major corridors. And, and it, you know, the very big picture, you'd say, well, where's Kalgoorlie? It's actually pretty obvious now in terms of the, what the understanding we've got. It's the central axis 
of the main rift that develops on the margin of the Ewan Mee Kralong, where that intersects the first order or one of the first order boundaries that's preserved in the Ewan Mee Kralong, which is inherited from the uh, Nar Narria terrain and the very original assembly of the proto Ewan Mee. So you see that and you, you get the X marks a spot. It's very similar in the Copper Belt. You know, you can apply really high level architecture that picks out the bigger deposits. When you go down to the smaller ones that you have to include, you know, no disrespect to First Quantum, but the frontiers, the Sentinels and, and the Western area, then you have to go down to another level of complexity in your targeting. But the really big ones come out from the first level lithospheric architecture. Yeah, I think uh, another thing you'd look at taking the gold example, um, and I said, like, I've had this discussion before, as I mentioned when I was uh, chatting with uh, Ross there. Uh, is that, you know, I came from a metamorphic background in, in gold and looking at metamorphism as the source. And I still accept that metamorphism can provide a big amount of gold into a system. But then you look at, at, at terrains of the same age, right, it, and uh, they have similar, similar features, similar metamorphic grades, and one super well endowed and the other one not so well endowed. You say, okay, well, what's making that difference? Right? And so the, the argument I have is, is that you've got metamorphic terrains of similar age all over the world, not all of them equally endowed. So people say, yeah, but there's gold in all of them. There's not world-class gold in all of them. So there's some other component. And the more we've looked at the, the giant systems, we see that there's often multiple periods of mineralization. I think John Miller showed really well with the Laverton area. You've got four periods of mineralization, each with a very different signature and under a different stress regime in the same volume of rock, right? It takes the question away from why is the gold in this dilational jog to why did this bit of lithosphere get hit by lightning so many times? Something's favorable about that architecture, right? Now, do we fully understand the process? No, but you know, with, with this idea of, of the, the self-organization, of, of natural systems. Uh, if you take that a bit further, you start looking for things like a areas of anomalous compression. Well, it may be no coincidence that when you look at the Timmins camp in the Abitibi, or you look at Kalgoorlie and, and, and St. Ives in the, um, in the uh, Kalgoorlie terrain, in those areas, like at, at St. Ives, that's one of the few places in the middle of the greenstone belt you see the footwell, footwell basalt exposed. Right? At Kalgoorlie, You've, you, you've doubled up, you know, basal stratigraphy above the boulder fault, right? So these, these are areas that, that may be proxies for areas of anomalous compression because they're areas of essentially the highest uplift, right? So there may, we may be able to use those types of proxies in the data sets. With that aspects of self-ordering, the other thing you could look at is, is at the time that the system's under anomalous compression and you build up a fluid reservoir, what you might also be doing is supersaturating that fluid. So when you get these veins that are like, like John showed a picture of, that are you know a, a centimeter wide, and they go for 15 meters, and they're essentially solid gold, you know it's hard to get that from a 30 ppb fluid. Right? When right next to it is a big quartz vein, which obviously had a big pressure drop, and it doesn't have as much gold. So there are these moments of potential uh, transient supersaturation in the fluid. If that's the case, we should be able to record that in minerals that were in the reservoir. So that we might be able to use our detrital mineral record, uh, understanding some well-studied systems, and then be able to take what we see out of that into the detrital record, into areas under cover to see if parts of belts self-organize to form high-quality ore. So there's a long answer to your question. And I guess I'd just like to address a little bit the lithospheric fertility component of it, using the example of the, the Tian Shan gold belt in Central Asia, which uh, Ross alluded to today, but generally considered to be the most endowed orogenic gold deposit, uh, gold belt in the world. But what's interesting about that is that statement is not necessarily true as a generic statement, because if you look along the Turkestan suture, which is the environment that broadly hosts that, that particular belt, you can see that it actually segments into domains with very different endowment. So there's the Uzbekistan segment that's got Murrintal, Zamatan and a whole lot of other deposits. So you know, a whole heap of greater than 10 million ounce deposits. 
But then in, in, in Tajikistan, the best you get out of it is about a, about a million ounces. And then through a lot of that Turkestan, you know, about 100 kilometres or so strike in, in Kyrgyzstan, that same belt, that same orogenic feature is effectively barren. It's got no endowment until you get to Kumtor. And in all those cases, you can quite clearly relate that segmentation to the lithospheric architecture of the blocks in the hinterland to that Turkestan suture. The, you know, the Turkestan suture is the first order control. In fact, it goes all the way around the, the margin of, of, of Siberia and Baltica because there's Berevoski on one side and, uh, and Bakiracik on, on, on the other and, and the Tian Shan ones. But in detail, it segments into you know, zones that are 100 or a couple hundred kilometres long with very different fertility. So saying, oh, this is great. I've got a strike length of the greatest gold belt on Earth. That might not actually help you if the lithospheric fertility is wrong. On the other hand, getting into the more fertile areas can be very important. How do you recognise that? Uh, well, empirically, it's important. One of the important things is early gold, late gold, it doesn't really matter. If you believe in the concept of fertility, so you'll find that gold-rich VMS, gold-rich gold early processes become a pretty good guide to, to later gold and vice versa. And, you know, there's a couple of ways that you might explain that. And we heard, heard one from Ross, but one of them is just that we're continually tapping those, those same uh, fertile uh, parts of the mantle. You know, the, the Western US, as Silite showed, you know, you've got this small area where from the Cretaceous to, to the late uh, Miocene, You've got a whole heap of different gold deposits, a whole heap of different styles, uh, from orogenic to epithermal to VMS to whatever, but they're all coming in that, in that same rock volume. Uh, Jeff, um, I think what a lot of people are asking is, how does all of this make me target in the Yulgarn better, or in the Lake Superior better, or have in Lake Victoria better, if you're looking for greenstone gold? So um, one way to look at it is um, how, what, what data set would I use? So if we think that a, a thick, uh, complete greenstone sequence is really important from the ultrametrics at the base all the way through to the classics at the top, then maybe the best way to filter that along with what John was just saying, that parts of those long belts are fer more fertile than others, would be to look along those belts to find out where the sequence is preserved. And a proxy for that is, if you've got a gravity data set, you might want to look where the gravity data set shows that you've got the thickest parts of the sequence, as an example, right? So, but th that's always the challenge is turning um, the mineral systems uh, and big, um, you know, hundreds of kilometres systems into manageable targets from camp and then local scale to drill target. Don't know if that helps. Perhaps throw the question back at the audience, but to put it back into the, I guess, the public service context, historically, the survey has been providing large data sets because we assumed you knew what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically it. You were asking for large data set that we thought you were, so we would provide them to you. Now, it seems that the data sets we're providing aren't being used now, or the, certainly the, the ones we produced in the past, so we've decided to take it a step further where we start using the data ourselves to develop ideas about how to target mineralisation, at least at the regional scale. Along with that, that invo has involved engaging our, our collaborators in research to better understand the mineral systems so that we know how we're going to be using those data sets. So, and from what we've produced then is these, we're starting to produce these prospectivity analyses for these less well explored terrains uh, using the ideas that uh, CAMS group and other groups have come up with for, uh, for targeting particular mineral systems. So we don't know whether that's what you want. We've put it out there. The idea is you will either embrace it and use it, you'll just go to those red spots on the map and say, well, we're going to drill here anyway and have a look, or you'll take the concept of how the targeting was done and take it away and do your own prospectivity analysis and then go off and do it. You'll, you'll believe in the, in the whole process of mineral systems using mineral systems to target. But again, we don't know really whether that's what you want. So I throw the question to the audience here, what really do you want somebody like a survey to be doing for you? Or what do you want the researchers to be doing for you? What, I mean, that knowing that you're all competitors and we don't just want I'm sure you'd all love us to tell you where to drill, but we can't just tell one person where to drill, we've got to tell everyone where to drill. 
and that then becomes horrendously complicated. Do you want us to tell you where to drill? Or do you want us to develop a technique that you can go away and use your minds? We know there's quite a few bright people out there in industry. Use what we give you to develop your own targeting. And I guess this also addresses the whole Uncover initiative that, uh, that Robbie has been uh, promoting. As we need really now to know whether what we're doing is what you want. And I also bear in mind too that we have to serve the public service, we have to serve the entire community. It's not just the big end of town, not just the small end of town. So we're, we're in a bit of a, an invidious position where we have to cater for everyone uh, and hopefully that doesn't mean we're not actually catering for anyone. Trevor, I would love stand-up drill targets. <laughs> so who do we tell? I've got one, one response to that is um, who's going to pay for us to do that? Sorry, um, Trevor, um, I, think, I think you really answered your own question because you are reliant on working with industry to get the data. And if you start getting the business of providing drill targets, industry is not going to share that data with you anymore because you have to release it competitively. So you can't go down that road. The reason why it's called free competitive releases. Indeed, indeed. So, yeah. There's some questions over here too. But this is, this is uh, while, the, while the mic's migrating, this is why um, uh, getting involved with this Uncover initiative is very important because it's your chance to have a say. There's, it's not just about, first of all, we have to realize the power of speaking with a single voice. Right? When we speak to, say, federal government agencies like this and look for support for initiatives to help our industry. But number two, there's already a fair amount of money that goes into geoscience. But are we doing the optimal work with it? This is your chance to get there, get involved, have your say, and also learn something in the process by networking with your peers in the process about best use of pre-competitive data. Can I just comment on the, um, some of the aspects of what we've been hearing today? If our mineral systems models or exploration models, whatever you want to call them, were, were working, we'd be discovering more deposits two or three or 10 or 20 a year, but we're not. And what we don't want, or if I was in industry still, what I wouldn't want is for everyone to think the same way and to come up with the same model. I advocate multiple working hypotheses. That's what I was taught by Sam Carey a long time ago, and it's really the best way to go. You don't put all your money into one basket or on one model, you spread it across several potential models. Now, I know that that's really difficult for any individual company to do, to explore using multiple uh, hypotheses. But it's, it's a basis that you've got to have in your background. I agree with Cam that when you go to government, government always wants to hear that all scientists agree. They don't like division. It's like the climate change debate. They want all scientists to say, yes, climate change is happening. It's going to do this, this, and this. They want all geologists to say, yes, we've got this great model and it's going to help us find lots more ore deposits. And that might be a way of getting money out of government, but it's certainly not a way to explore that we all use the same model, that 100 companies in Western Australia all use the same mineral system model. We need 10 models with 10 companies using each model. And then we'll have a chance of finding more ore deposits. Ross, I guess the response I'd make to this is that the reason why we're not finding more ore deposits is because we're doing almost no exploration in that greenfield space that is oriented towards finding ore deposits. A lot of it is brownfields, a lot of it is drilling things that never should have been drilled, a lot of it is, is proving things that were proven a long time ago. If you actually look at what is happening in greenfields, the genuine greenfields, I would argue it's actually been quite successful. We've had discoveries like Sandfire, we've had discoveries like Nova, um, from my personal experience, the mineral systems method has successfully targeted the West Musgrave province, which is, is continuing to emerge. With Encounter, we were able to find uh, virgin uh, copper, sedimentary hosted copper systems. Um, we, I think there's a lot actually happening in this space, and from a very small, a very, very small percentage of these vast amounts of exploration and expenditure that we read about, very small has actually been directed into genuine greenfield space. I want to commend uh, 
first quantum for, for, for excellent work doing that. That's the type of work that will find the next generation of water deposits. Very few companies have had the courage of, of first quantum. Most companies, they, they, they say, oh, give me the advanced project where someone's drew a hole and de-risked it. Well, that doesn't actually happen. That does, that's, not, you know, that, that's like a free lunch. And, and, and that doesn't actually happen in the world. It's, it's about actually getting the exploration into the areas that no one's actually looked at before. No one's actually found the ore load. So uh, you know, I disagree that with the characterisation that these things aren't working. I think in the cases where people are applying them, they're actually working pretty well. It's just that by and large, we're still doing the 20th century type of exploration. Also, I think you, you misread it there, Ross. When I say speaking with one voice, I don't mean let's all have consensus on the way to, uh, you know, this is how I draw my boxes on a map, right? When I say speaking with one voice, we can still have an overall strategy of what needs to be done and within it have multiple working hypotheses. You know, John Walsh and I have very different ideas of what control aspects of mineral systems, but that's fine, right? That, that we still agree with this idea of speaking sure, with one sure voice, I right? All. Yeah, so, but it's a little too much focus, you know, So by mapping the processes, you can fit all sorts of models into those. You know, you might want to look for the alkaline fluids or the acid fluids or the reduced fluids or the oxidised fluids. But the mineral systems process is mapping the fluids. You can then apply which particular one you want to find in there. And I think we, we don't do that enough. I've, I've just spent the last three years effectively doing this mineral systems approach, looking for VMS and the Yulgarn, uh, privately funded, for which we, we thank our backers very much. We haven't had a lot of success because what we found in the three years is that the models actually changed. Once we started mapping the fluid cells that we were seeing, we found they were, well, there were two end members, whereas we started off with a model of one. But when we mapped the processes, we found that there were actually several end members that didn't fit our original model. Now, if we could carry that on further, I'm sure that down the track we would have success. But it's doing that first work mapping the process, not actually applying the old original rigid, rigid, uh, rigid model that will work. And I think that's an important thing to think of is it's mapping the processes now, not just applying the, the cartoon model originally. Just uh, talking to, to Trevor's point, I think um, the role of the survey by and large in the past has been providing the data sets that's outside the scope of companies to get out there and acquire. Either it's outside their, their cost regime or it's outside their tenement boundary. So, so in terms of context, I think if you start going down the process of putting exosome maps based on a mineral system approach and developing a model, then it becomes a black box. And then you know the, the, the thought process goes out of exploration and I think it will waste more money than what it will potentially save. <laughs> As I say, said in my presentation, what we're trying less to actually put X's on, on, on the, the spots on the maps is to get people thinking about how to apply this approach and go and do it themselves using either our data sets or their data sets. Now, in order to do that, really, it's a bit, a bit chicken and egg because someone needs to put a spot on a map, somebody needs to then go and test it and decide whether it works or not for that particular spot on the map. And if it doesn't, why it doesn't, and then it goes round and round and round. But it has to start somewhere. I mean, companies I know, certainly some of the bigger companies, have been applying a sort of a mineral systems approach, uh, more, more an empirical side of things um, in, in, the, in the past. Uh, but we've come to the, the realisation that to get out exploring undercover where you can't get any direct detection of deposits initially, you really need to go down this whole conceptual approach. And so what, what do we need to actually make that effective undercover? And big data sets are one thing, but what sort of data sets? What, what, what does industry need in order to be able to do this? Look, you are talking about grassroots exploration. It's high risk and expensive. Juniors who are doing a lot of work in Australia now need money. If you can't raise money, you can't go out and do grassroots exploration. Sure, you could raise money for brownfields as an extension of a gold deposit here. But if I went out and said, look, I'm going to go explore this area out there, it's 
50K by 50K, no evidence of mineralisation, give me $100 million, would you? Well, what's interesting is that right now there's private equity funds who are supporting that, but you're right. And, and so there's a whole lot of stuff going on in Western Australia that I think um, many people in this room are not aware of because there are smart people who, who in the investment community who see that opportunity. The reality is, though, you're, you're right, that the um, conceptual projects without the uh, illusion of progress because of discoveries and mineralisation are hard to fund. Though right now, even the projects with the illusion of, of progress are hard to fund. I think what goes on here is there's a, there's a real heuristic that leads to a, a, a real bad cognitive error in our business, and it's people confusing, and invest in, investors do this all the time, but unfortunately so do uh, many of us in the exploration community, is we confuse certainty and risk, right? So we say a Greenfields project is high risk, and it's higher risk than this project here that's got a lot of mineralisation. In many cases, the majority of cases, that is absolutely, totally crap, right? The project with a lot more mineralisation is extremely high risk because several generations of geologists have just about mined it with the drill rig and proven that it will never, ever, ever, ever work unless you get top of cycle metal prices for 20 years, which will never happen. So some of this is in the language. So I, I would actually challenge this idea that Greenfields is high risk, this other stuff is low risk. In a lot of cases, and, and I, I can't talk about some internal studies that I've been privy to, to companies who've spent a billion dollars and then retrospectively looked at, you know, which was high risk and which was really low risk. And we're talking about not risk for the exploration manager, who it, it's low risk to go into something where there's no mineralisation because everyone else is doing it and you can get a news flow, but actually probably high risk for the investor because there's no chance the investor's going to get a return in most cases. We're talking about risk in terms of the original investor, the shareholder, and his or her return on investment. And I think when you apply that, you see that these terms we throw around, high risk and low risk, when it comes to greenfields and advanced projects, are often 100% wrong. Maybe that's where the government and the things need to be educated the public or the investors that grassroots exploration is where it should be. Maybe that's the role of the West Australian government. Well, I, I spent 18 years in industry myself, and, and so I, I think I know a little bit about what industry wants. But to answer your question, or to, to address your question about poorly funded or underfunded juniors, well, we, we are obliged to, as I say, serve all the entire community. And so what out of what we're doing would most benefit uh, the junior sector, and uh, if we're not doing it, what should we be doing? And we, we don't know because we don't get the feedback because no one talks to each other. And, <laughs> and so we, you know, we, we have no mechanism at the moment for actually getting any feedback for what, you know, not individual companies, but what does the junior sector want? What does the mid-tier mid sector want? What, is, what do the majors want? Is there some component or some several components out of what we could do that everybody wants? We just don't know. One more question, and then we'll have to wrap it up. <laughs> it's not really a question, it's actually a statement back to Trevor. Um, I think the report that you guys wrote, the and re re released recently, report one, two, three on, uh, on the Capricorn area, it was absolutely superb. And from a, an explorer's point of view, it gave you uh, almost X marks a spot, spot type criteria in terms of targeting. And it was based on some really good information that was obviously drawn from collaboration between yourselves and the CET. And I think from, um, you know, trying to get that sort of information into the marketplace and, and for juniors, that is the perfect matchup between the two groups. Because that does, the CET of course has a lot of funding from the industry and it gives you that background as to what we want, even if you're not getting it from us directly. Well, I, I accepted on behalf of the Geological Survey, even though we, we really, our role really was to provide the data sets to the CET to, uh, to do that survey on our behalf. Uh, as a, really, it's an experiment just to see you know, a, a new approach or, or ex extending the approach that uh, could be applied to, to our data sets. And, and again, I just say, is this what you want? Um, do you want us to continue it or do you want us to co be continuing just collecting data and you want to use it? I think
think that's that's it for the panel discussion and I'm sure these gentlemen are going to be having a, a drink with us so um, there'll be a chance to talk to them then but I'll just get Susie to, to wrap up the seminar for today. Well hello everyone it's great to see all your faces here um, unfortunately I wasn't here at the beginning of the day but what I saw at the end um, was truly a wonderful um, seminar that AIG once again put on and that's thanks to um, Michelle and Matthew uh, Michelle actually spearheaded the initiative to um, for this topic and with support from Matthew and of course from Jocelyn who is our events manager and the store of all our seminars. So um, yes, yeah, so once again it's great to see you doing a life learning um, exercise here. Um, well that's the buzzword in my area or field that I'm working in at the moment and especially in these times um, that which are lean so to speak in terms of exploration. Um, it's a good chance to catch up on all, uh, diversify your knowledge catch up with old friends, get to know what's going on and um, in, enjoy, keep getting better at what you actually do. So, um, so thank you to that. Thank you, of course, to our sponsors uh, who are always there also to help us along the way. And the banners are up here as well as in your little books. And um, if you're not part of the AIG, please do so, be and um, join us for Dreams after this. Thank you very much.